Tonight, Director Trevor Parsons is going to provide insight into the existence of the Ku Klux Klan in our area during the 20s to 40s. Who knew that they were here then? As an organization devoted to making history come alive for the people of our region, the Hastings County Historical Society has a responsibility to educate on topics both popular and controversial. Although tonight's material may be somewhat controversial, it is being presented in the hopes of highlighting how society's opinions and behavior have changed over the years. Such material is presented in the spirit of educating the public towards positive and inclusive attitudes in the future. I'd now call upon Director Jonathan Chirkop to introduce our guest speaker. Welcome and good evening. So before I get started, uh, I'd just like to say that if you've missed one of our most recent uh, monthly presentations, that they are now available to be viewed uh, a few weeks after their filming uh, on YouTube by searching Hastings County Historical Society on YouTube. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> It's, it's very rewarding work, so if there is anyone considering, like Roland said, for a position on the board, uh, I will look forward to your application. Um, so this month's speaker, month speaker is uh, Trevor Parsons, of course, who is uh, part of uh, the board of directors team here at the Hastings County Historical Society. He is, uh, we've been working with him for about the last three years now, and uh, through all the ups and the downs, and the, does a lot of hard work for us, especially in regards to our displays. Uh, he's very passionate about history, uh, so much that he decided to obtain his BA in history from uh, Lawrence University in 2014 and a graduate certificate in museum studies in 2016. He continued his studies at Nipissing University, uh, where he obtained his master's in history in 2018. And when we're not keeping him busy designing posters and other things for us, uh, he is a current PhD student at the University of Waterloo, with his main focus being on um, the late 19th and early 20th century political culture of Canada and uh, the British world. So please welcome to the stage, Director Trevor Parsons. So today I'd just like to begin uh, this presentation by acknowledging that February is Black History Month uh, and it's a time uh, that we celebrate the contributions of black Canadians and uh, how they've made uh, Canada the culturally diverse, compassionate and prosperous nation that it is today. We must also be cognizant that Black History Month was born out of the exclusion of, of certain Canadians from, from our national story. As recent events here in Belleville have shown, we still have a, we still have a way, uh, ways to go, but this shouldn't distract us from putting the scourge of prejudice and racism into the trash bin of history. So in honor of Black History Month, uh, I just wanted to start uh, my presentation to talk about one of Ontario's more prominent uh, black uh, political figures. Uh, he celebrated every January 21st. Uh, his name was Lincoln Alexander. And, uh, 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 no, there we go. And he was Canada's first black MP. He was elected in 1968 uh, as a progressive conservative and served as Minister of uh, Labor in Joe Clark's very very, very short government in 1979. Uh, after uh, he retired in 1980, uh, he took on a few uh, roles uh, in the community before in 1985 being appointed Canada, or sorry, Ontario's Lieutenant Governor. Uh, his, first, uh, his first official uh, role as uh, Lieutenant Governor was actually here uh, in Hastings County, in Sterling, and uh, 
at the time, Premier uh, David Peterson uh, remembered a uh, fond little story that, I'll, that I will just uh, paraphrase for you. So he fondly recalled how it was a rain-soaked plowing match in Sterling where a hay wagon was used as a stage by the soggy farmers. He continued, half the crowd didn't know what a lieutenant governor was, and the rest had probably never spoken to a black man before. Outwardly, oblivious to the crowd's awkwardness, uh, Mr. Alexander climbed atop the wagon, looked on the sea of very, very white faces, and with his broad smile and warm bass voice greeted them with, man, you're my kind of people. <laughs> so throughout his life, uh, Alexander was bombarded with uh, racially tinged questions, uh, but he raised himself above such petty uh, matters, serving with grace, dignity, and fondness for the province we all love. So now to the main event. That works. There we go, okay. So the Ku Klux Klan emerged out of the tense political and social environment of post-Civil War America, out of a town called Pulaski, Mississippi. Now, it was a vigilante group that was organized to terrorize recently freed African Americans in order to prevent them from exercising their civil rights and to vote. For t reasons too complicated and for, because it's a very long story, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but the first Klan fizzled out. Uh, it was mostly due to the uh, American army. Uh, they, they, were, they did their most, the utmost to uh, kind of stomp out what they saw as a kind of a terrorist group, but it was W.D. Griffith's 1915 silent film, The Birth of a Nation, that precipitated the modern iteration of the Klan in the U.S. It was a tale of a southern Klansman defending women from the barbarism of Yankee carpetbaggers and hordes of free slaves. This now infamous film triggered a revived Klan that within a decade would claim up to six million American members including leading, leading members of the political, social, and economic uh, society. But just as quickly did the Klan uh, expand in the US that it looked to expand in other places. And the most obvious uh, location for them was Canada. So uh, Julian Shear, who's a historian, he wrote that frantic Klansmen, roaming like Alexander for new worlds to conquer, cast their eyes upon Canada. It was Montreal uh, that saw the first organized Klan uh, as part of the large-scale revival occurring in the U.S. But, as for reasons you can imagine, uh, the Klan being the organization that it was and Quebec being, you know, Quebec, uh, <laughs> it, it didn't have a lot of support. Uh, so it looked to Ontario. And by and large, uh, from what I could tell and from what I researched, the first uh, Klan here in Ontario was organized in late 1924 by a bunch of Americans. One was uh, J.H. Hawkins. He was a doctor from New York who had previously served as the Grand Dragon of Maryland. Uh, and Louis Fowler, a Baptist preacher from West Virginia, in partnership with and it's pretty, pretty amazing, a member of parliament here in Canada uh, from Saskatchewan of all places named Walter Cohen. Papers were quick to question the motives of American nationalists like Fowler and others uh, trying to instill Canada's sense of uh, nationhood. Uh, so one paper uh, asked, why a Virginian should appoint themselves to teach loyalty to Canadians may well be wondered at, and why, should be, why they should be so particularly concerned in trying to hold the British Empire together is another case for wonder. 
Another paper uh, from Welland, which is near Niagara, uh, has what is, in my opinion, the best quote about the Klan. And it, he, it, they called them, quote, a scheme to sell cotton nightgowns to boobs. So according to our illustrious local scholar, Jerry Boyce, the Klan arrived here in the Quinney area in the summer of 1925. On Ju July 29th, uh, passengers aboard the steamer Brockville sighted a 30-foot burning cross on the promontory between Bra Bay Bridge and Zwick's Island. A police investigation into this proved to be fruitless. Just over a week later, three more crosses illuminated the summer sky. The first one on a small island north of uh, Bay Bridge. The second was in the West Hill Fairgrounds. And the third on Dundas Street Burying Ground. On uh, September 14th, uh, a resident on South John Street was awoken in the middle of the night to a fiery cross being burned on his lawn. So after this, the mayor at the time, Mayor Mickle, Michael, Michael, thank you, uh, attempted to preempt uh, any more expansion into the city. So what he did was he saw a pamphlet about a Klan event that was going to take place. It was a lecture about uh, their goals, their you know, desires, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so he went to them, uh, but unfortunately it was raining. So their public event outside, which could have been stopped, went indoors to a private facility. So the mayor had uh, absolutely no power to stop that. So one of the few uh, confirmed Klan members was a lady by the name of Flora Bell, uh, as well as her husband, Everett. Now she wrote to Jerry uh, that the Klan, quote, did good work when and where it was needed and that it was strictly Protestant and of good character. She stressed that the Canadian clan should not be confused with the actions of that of the clan down south. So it's, uh, let's see, that's the letter. Uh, the only good thing I'll say about it is that she has very nice handwriting. Uh, apart from that, uh, have with it what you will. So in order to be a member of the clan, a person had to so solemnly promise and swear that they will always, uh, at all times and in all places, help, aid, and assist the duly constituted officers of the law in proper performance of their legal duties. So one of them So the first uh, important point was that you had to be a Protestant Christian. Uh, you had to have absolute belief in Jesus Christ, but holding no enmity or ill will towards those who cannot meet this requirement. Yeah, okay. Uh, it asks that uh, the same rights be granted to Protestants that were to Catholics, Jews and others. And they will, they will ask no other favors that were not granted to anybody else. That they were devoted to public schools. Public schools were, were in their minds, the location where proper Protestant, and I know Protestant values could be instilled. Uh, it is pledged to honor the virtuous womanhood and the sanctity of the home because, of course, the place of, of ladies were, you know, in the home. I'm not saying that they are. <laughs> they believed that the future salvation of Canada rests in the hands of, Anglo of the Anglo-Saxon race and not uh, to the peoples of Southern Europe or Asia, and they will always fight uh, for the building of a pure Nordic race in Canada. That's where they get a little more uh, of that clannishness in there. Uh, 
that, the, that its members have the courage of their convictions and that they will never be found fighting to dethrone wrong or enthrone right in the dominion of Canada, looking ever to Christ as their criterion for character. You know, it's, yeah. <laughs> in addition, they had to assert and affirm that the British crown in any position uh, thereof uh, that they may become resident, they would swear uh, an unqualified allegiance uh, with any, any kind of government in the world. I here and now pledge my life, my vote, and my sacred honor to uphold its flag, its constitution, its constitutional laws, and will protect, and defend, and enforce the same unto death. In another document I found, uh, 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 it stated that believing in the principles announced below and wishing to affiliate myself with real patriots of like faith and convictions, I hereby request full information regarding the patriotic order whose foundational uh, principles are named below. So here they are. If you haven't already guessed, Protestantism. White supremacy, Gentile economic freedom, just laws and liberty, true patriotism, separation of church and state, freedom of speech and press, restrictive and selective immigration, law and order, higher moral standards, public schools, and freedom from mob violence. Now the last one is especially kind of that now, let's, okay, let's not, okay, there. That is the population of Hastings County uh, according to the 1921 census. And so, I'm gonna play a little game now. Uh, and forget all the numbers you saw before. <laughs> and there are particular groups who the Klan uh, virulently hated uh, and I, Let's figure out how many of these people were actually in Hastings County. So there, 57,523 people in Hastings County. Now, when we talk about Southern Europeans, Italians, my grandmother's family. Uh, so how many Italians were there? Take a guess. Come on. Seven thousand. Oh my God! <laughs> this isn't Rome. <laughs> Whoever said two hundred was as close as I think. Yeah, point three nine percent of the population. Now, how many Jewish people would you say there were? Eight. Eight? Well, I mean. 20, getting up there, 50, oh, a little bit more, 100, a little less, okay, let's, can, uh, there, 84, in all of Hastings County, so 0.1% of the population, how many Polish people, Polish people, nice people, 40, 40. that's insanely close, uh, 46. How many Hungarians were there? Two. <laughs> Seriously? Oh, ah, there we go. Hungarians, one. <laughs> and for those of you who are wondering, it was a lady. Uh, well, uh, fine. Catholics. 37%. Uh, and I'll just, uh, since I've, I've completely bungled this, there were uh, 23 uh, people who uh, worshipped various Eastern religions. Uh, there were uh, just over a thousand First Nations. Uh, and and I, I couldn't really qualify this because I'm not sure if it was people who were ethnically French or people who spoke French, but they, 
there were about 3,200, or 5%. So, yeah, that was, that's a diverse, uh, that's what we call multiculturalism. Uh, so, in Hastings County, the Klan was led, if you can guess it, by a reverend, the Reverend George Marshall. So, behind the veneer of respectability that his position uh, afforded him, uh, Reverend Marshall of Belleville's reformed Emmanuel Episcopal Church preached the gospel of intolerance, prejudice, masked by the infamous white hood, although in his case, it's purple because officers wore purple. Very regal. So, uh, and what, what, what makes this a little bit worse for him was that in spite of being a public clan member, he eventually became a bishop in his own church. So at a ceremony in 1932, he went over to the UK and was uh, consecrated as uh, a bishop in what was called an austere ceremony. So at least it wasn't, you know, too auspicious or... So his position uh, did absolutely nothing from preventing uh, newspapers and periodicals from uh, calling him what he was, which was, according to one, a disgrace to the cloth. So uh, let me see if I can, there we go. Oh. So at every opportunity, the Klan claimed and told everybody who listened that they were apolitical. They weren't interested in enforcing their Protestantism, their belief in public schools, or their, 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 their gendered ideas, all of that. That was apolitical. That they were above uh, petty party politics, but we all know this just wasn't the case. And one letter I found uh, from December 1925, uh, it said that the the cry of, that the Liberal Party was the party controlled by Quebec and had a certain effect on the election. And another, uh, written on the Klan letterhead that uh, you saw earlier, at the next election, we as a body are out to rid this Dominion Parliament of every Roman Catholic nominee and thereby break the domination of Rome in this country. That's what you call being apolitical. So... Where am I here? Another letter saw uh, the Conservative Party threatened uh, that if they decided to appoint any nominees who were Catholic or who, who were empathized with the rights of Catholic or French people, that the Klan would, would run a candidate against them. So indeed, and uh, what I'm, when I'm about to say afterwards this, the, the Klan didn't have a lot of prominent people, but the people it did have were incredibly prominent. Uh, so one of them was uh, Cow Cohen, who I mentioned. Uh, he was an MP from Saskatchewan. Uh, Premier Anders Anderson uh, from Saskatchewan as well. And, and this actually blew my mind, uh, a guy by, by the name of Hugh Guthrie, who became uh, leader of the Conservative Party. Yeah. yeah. These political ties were not unfamiliar to locals, however. In 1924, the Conservative MP here in uh, Hastings, his name Gus Porter, he resigned his seat, causing a stir uh, that he, because he chose to, after he resigned, he decided, well, I want to run again. So he ran again. Uh, Ontario uh, Premier uh, Howard Ferguson at the time assured the Prime Minister that all reports indicate that the situation has improved very much for Porter and that there is no question now as to his re-election. Surprise, surprise, Porter lost. Uh, he lost to the Liberal Charles Hanna. But there was one incident uh, during the election campaign that, uh, where the Klan was very, very prominent. So, uh, at a campaign event hosted by uh, Charles Hanna, it was a, a community dance. Uh, let me change that. No. 
Uh, it was a community dance, but as the intel would say, the, the event was invaded uh, with a fiery cross burned. Belleville people are keeping a close watch on the activities of the clan. The crowd rushed out of the dance hall when the alarm was given and the cross was torn down. The clan, the clan claimed that each cross at the time uh, represented 100 new members. So by that time, which was September 1924, there had been six cross burnings. So 600 members in uh, Hastings County. Uh, did the clan support Gus Par Porter? Not really. Uh, he was known to support, uh, um, he, he defended uh, a First Nations uh, gentleman. Uh, so I really doubt the clan would uh, throw their support behind him for that. But why did they choose to disrupt uh, Hannah's event? I don't know. On the face of it, you know, Porter w was their ideal choice. He was an Orangeman. Uh, he was active in the community. He, he supported all the right causes for them. But as I said, uh, he defended certain treaty rights for First Nations people. So there were uh, a few prominent individuals uh, who joined the Klan, uh, including our premier, our, our future premier, uh, Mitch Hepburn. Uh, he was accused of having taken out a membership in 1927. The accusation that he got a membership uh, occurred here in Belleville. So there was a gentleman uh, who, uh, who claimed that the premier took, took a membership out near London and that he was now supporting uh, behind the scenes the Klan and its activities. Uh, the, again, that... The, who knows? Uh, there's no real answer to if that's actually true. But uh, it was he, Mitch Hepburn at the time admitted uh, to knowing the organizer who recruited him, uh, but he claimed that the, uh, oh dear, he claimed that the uh, signature on the membership card was forged. So who knows? Uh, Hepburn's close friend, his name was Ed Carty, uh, said, uh, it didn't matter if he was a member because uh, the voters couldn't care a darn. I, it's not darn, but <laughs> you know. So the Klan never issued a denial, like I said, and uh, whether or not uh, they supported Mitch Hepburn, we'll never know. But the largest Klan meeting here in Belleville took place with over uh, 1,500 people in attendance. Uh, yeah, so speeches were made uh, in excellent temper and were eloquent expositions of their aims. British Constitution, the Union Jack, preservation of the right, white race, and so on. Uh, but they stressed that they were not for intolerance. They would have none of it. <laughs> yeah, that's actually in there. That, that, that's their words. So apart from the actual attendees, there were over 10,000 onlookers uh, who watched as four gigantic crosses were lit on fire uh, as Klansmen patrolled around. There was a bra br brass, bra brass, oh, brain fart. Brass band that played sacred music. They, uh, one of the hymns was uh, Onward Christian Soldiers. Uh, they played that a lot. Uh, and there was uh, a performance by the Imperial Command of the Ladies of the KKK. Yeah, ladies. So 60 new members were initiated. Uh, one of them, uh, one of the people were, was carrying a burning cross, headed the procession, and each station, uh, the candidates were halted and their, 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 obligations were repeated and then they were officially part of the Klan. Uh, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. I actually tried to find a picture of them, I couldn't. So. Oh. That's a membership card. It's actually from Oshawa. 
there, interestingly, Oshawa has a very large list of members. Uh, so if you're from Oshawa and you've ever thought that your family may have been in the clan, maybe. So uh, the stage uh, of the event was decorated with a large Union Jack. Uh, the Klansmen wore white robes with uniquely Canadian symbols. So on the right breast, my, this way, uh, on the white, right breast, there was a Canadian flag. It was green in a uh, red circle. And on the other breast was a cross uh, a white cross on a red circle. And this was uh, their way of, oh, they also had tassels. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> like, when I think of tassels, and it may not be able to, nice to say this in a church, but it's wearing them on your, your hat, on your hood, is not the place where I would expect tassels to be. <laughs> but... That's all I'll say on the matter. <laughs> so guards were stationed at the entrance to prevent people uh, from infiltrating. Um, namely, they thought Catholics, Catholics and Jews. Uh, each attendee had to present a pass and give their religious affiliation, just in case any secret Catholics were interested in becoming members. <laughs> so reporters from the intel were allowed uh, access to the event and according to them, they received the most courteous treatment. Uh, and the Klansmen readily answered the, any questions that were put to them. When asked about how many local members uh, they had, the Klansmen responded, practically every town and village in Prince Edward County and the southern portion of Hastings County uh, uh, had members. In all, members for both counties, uh, there were approximately 1,100. Uh, but this must be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, groups like these tend to inflate their numbers. So the speaker stated that as a member of a certain parliament, this is Cowan, uh, I'm doing my best to maintain the fine old British ideals. We must help our white Gentile Protestant businessmen. We must help our Canadian lads to stay here. Let me say that again, as a member of parliament, a member of parliament, because we all know MPs do nothing but say very pleasant things. Uh, it was uh, Lincoln Alexander was that fuddle-duddle incident with, uh, with uh, uh, Pierre Trudeau. Uh, so he has a lot of, uh, you know. His speech was basically a diatribe against every discernible group that wasn't Protestant and British. Uh, although, as we've seen, there weren't that many people in Hastings County to actually target. Not that they should have been targeted, I should say. Nobody should be targeted. The Klan's bad. <laughs> Don't join it. That's my, that's my, uh, that's my warning. Uh, so the use of religious language was very common for these sorts of rallies. It was said that Jesus Christ was sacrificed and crucified because he preached a certain doctrine. Great leaders like Martin Luther and John Wesley were persecuted for their own teachings. And we're trying to establish things that are good for the dominion. There's a great need at that moment to inculcate anew the principles that were slipping away. The Klan argued that they were a force for white Protestant Canadians who did not want to see their country overwhelmed by, quote, Catholics or Jews or Orientals. Uh, there is a danger of one great sect, one great sect, it's obviously Catholics, uh, gaining control over the country, and we stand to lose even our ideals of Christianity if that happens. Even worse, Canada with its immigration system was on the verge of sharing the same problem with the US, with, quote, millions of Negroid people. Uh, the solution to them was simple, to use Australia's model. Australia, uh, the speaker uh, said, was 90% British. And that was the model they wanted to, for Canada. How that was going to happen, considering at the time about 25% were French, and 
I, I'm not actually too, too sure how many uh, my other minorities there were. Uh, we can only imagine what they would do. So we must preserve the British ideals, keep our bodies clean to have a clean nation. They, what's most common about the Klan is that they use this kind of very racialized language and it, yeah, it, it's, it's disturbing. I'll say that. So rather bizarrely, it was claimed that all restaurants here in Belleville, except one, and I don't know which one, uh, were owned by foreigners. And because of this, white Gentile Protestant men were apparently afraid to start this sort of business for fear of failure. Now, I, I don't know what having uh, a person of a different ethnicity uh, owning a restaurant has to do with whether you're going to succeed as a businessman. Uh, who knows? But one thing is for sure, the Klan actually created jobs. They did. And that event, uh, they created a demand for bus drivers and taxi men, uh, as the intel reported. So on uh, February 28, 1930, uh, a group of approximately 70 Klansmen donned their robes and hoods upon learning that a man by the name of Ira Johnson, a black man, was to marry Isabel Jones, a white woman. The Klansman took Jones to her mother's home uh, while Johnson was told, quote, if they ever see him walking on down the street again with a white girl, they would attend to him. Uh, the Klan proceeded to burn a cross on the lawn of a family member after a public outcry, charges were laid against some of the perpetrators, uh, and the change was made to the criminal code at the time so that people couldn't wear uh, hoods at night. Uh, so in response to this law, uh, George Marshall was not very pleased. Uh, he said, I don't know what to think. Wonderful things are happening these days. I'm awfully sorry about this, what happened to uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, But for some time, I have thought of recommending that the use of masks be discontinued. But in view of its bitterness it seem, that seems to have crept in, I think it advisable to retain the mask for the Klanmen's security, not for the security of the people they're, they're terrorizing. So on a side note, the story of Jones and Johnson did have a happy ending. They got married that year, and they went on to have two children. I should have a picture of them. Uh. Oh, no. Any, any, anybody from Oshawa? That's your... <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> uh, that is the MP. Uh, the Parliament website did have a picture of him. So that's where I got that. Okay, that's one of their uh, kind of activity plans. Uh, they had everything for children. Married ladies race, fat men's race over 40 years. <laughs> Blind pig race, uh, a mop fight. <laughs> That'd be fun. So, you know, it wasn't all bad. And that's a letter written here in Belleville. There they are. Could you please do the next one now? Okay. Oh, God, where am I? Okay. On uh, the 22nd of October in 1926, S.D. Dawson, who was the editor of the Intel, uh, noted that the Klan's arrival in the area was, was met with and this is funny, tolerant amusement. Uh, it was good fun to watch the hooded warriors maneuver on uh, horseback and watch those mop fights, you know. 
so everything changed uh, when a church, uh, St. Mary's Church in Barrie, was the victim, uh, I guess, a terror attack, we would call it now. Uh, a stick of dynamite was thrown uh, and uh, blew a part of the church up. Uh, so uh, I, par uh, I, I, I took this actual uh, story from somewhere else, so I'm, th these aren't my words right now. Uh, just after 6 a.m. on Friday, uh, June 11th, the uh, church caretaker, Mr. LeClaire, arrived at St. Mary's and found a door on the north side of the building wide open. He was shocked to find that some kind of explosion had occurred, blowing a hole four feet around the floor in the area of the center aisle. The perpetrator, uh, surprise, surprise, was a Klan sympathizer who before being arrested 10 days after the fact, was sheltered by the Klan. Uh, they would later uh, claim innocence that they were the ones who turned him in after 10 days. Uh, and uh, so S.D. Dawson, uh, upon learning of this attack, uh, said that the public was awakened to the realization of the folly of stirring up sectarian strife and bitterness. And what uh, I can only describe as a chilling reminder of the importance of a free press, the Klan embraced what we would now call fake news. Uh, they said, the newspapers of this country have not broadcast the truth to the public. Uh, going on to say that the Klan didn't dynamite the church and bury, they just hid the person who did. <laughs> Big difference. Uh, indeed, such false claims uh, went so far, they, the, the Klan assumed that they had the support of the government. They didn't. Uh, so the OPP uh, waged an aggressive war against the Klan. Can we do one more? Okay. <laughs> so the OPP waged an aggressive war against the Klan with Commissioner uh, V.A.S. Williams declaring that the Klan was under constant surveillance. His deputy went even further, stating that we know who they are, we have their names, they are an American crowd from across the border, and we've known how long they've been organizing. Uh, the, uh, one of uh, Ontario's leading jurists uh, didn't min minced few words when he said that the Klan has its political basis, moral, political, religious intolerance. It seeks to stir up racial dislike where none existed. Well, a lot existed, obviously. Uh, its aim was to disseminate bitterness among religious denominations, which had no desire to engage in factional disputes. Such were the words of one of our leading jurists. The Klan's an American organization, uh, which can find no enduring place in Ontario. So from my research, uh, the most uh, powerful display of resistance to the Klan was undertaken by Dawson. Uh, uh, so he was relatively new to his position and as any new boss would, he wanted to shuffle things up and you know, change some things. So an elderly Protestant employee was uh, given lighter duties with no pay reduction and in his place was a Catholic, oh my God. When the Klan learned of this, they, they lost it. Uh, they sent a delegation to Dawson consisting of Reverend Marshall and another man, C.A. Rutten, the Klegel, or local chapter leader for Hastings County. Uh, Rutten and Marshall called for certain staff changes based on sectarian grounds because they were staunchly opposed to a Catholic having any authority over Protestants. Uh, Dawson's answer, as it should have been, was that a man's religion is his own concern and that he is advanced solely on his ability to handle his job. Uh, Dawson would describe at some length his qualifications. It was admitted that the young man in question was honest, capable, loyal to his employer. He paid his debts, lived a moral life, was a good husband and father, maintained his family in decency and comfort. Uh, all of this was true, but because he worshipped uh, and with a different ritual, he was not permitted to have uh, earn a living in Belleville. 
the, de the delegation uh, not only called for his firing, but stated that no Catholic, Jew, or Asian should be allowed to work in Belleville. None. So carried to its logical extreme, uh, this means that Belleville would be free of any Catholic, Jew, Asian, anybody that the Klan didn't like. And obviously that's quite terrifying. So why, uh, the question was asked, why is the Klan working against groups like uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary Club, the Kiwanis, all of them accepting the Klan were striving to build a bigger and better Belleville. Uh, the Klan called for a boycott of the intel, uh, but uh, the newspaper called this uh, the most tawdry form of attempted blackmail in history. Uh, so Dawson was uh, outraged at the Klan's uh, uh, desire for ethnic cleansing, and uh, so he took to his front, the front page of the newspaper and stating that he went out of his element to meet with his opponents on their ground to avoid even the appearance of unfairness in attacking the Klan through the press. Uh, against uh, professional orators in a crowd, it was a crowd in front of City Hall, actually, uh, and before a hostile audience, an amateur speaker, Dawson, had little chance. If the Reverend Marshall or any other Klansman wished to answer the charges against their organization through the columns of the intel, uh, they would have the space required. Now let's go back to that. What, what was the, what, one of their aims? Freedom of the press. So you can't fire people because they report things that you don't want to hear. And, you know, it, it goes to, they said a lot of grand things, but I could say a lot of grand things too here, and you know, doesn't mean it's true. Uh, so Marshall adamantly denied uh, any claim that he wanted to ethnically cleanse Belleville. Uh, uh, he pointed out that it wasn't a Klan delegation, it was just a delegation who shared the values of the Klan. But since Rutten was the chapter leader and uh, Marshall, who was generally understood to be the chaplain and leading spirit of the movement, uh, they were the delegation leaders, it was a Klan delegation. Uh, Marshall to told his uh, audience in front of City Hall that Dawson must be a Roman Catholic because no good Protestant would want to hire uh, a Catholic over a Protestant. Even worse, the accusation was that he was an atheist. Yeah. But in, in actuality, he was a practicing Presbyterian. So, even worse than an atheist. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, uh, yes. Uh, the events uh, were recounted by Dawson, as I said, on the front page of the Intel, but the news was actually reported across Canada and uh, parts of the U.S., and uh, with one paper saying, Marshall was obviously a disgrace to the cloth of a Christian clergyman. Uh, all sorts of slander were, were tossed at Dawson, like I just said, uh, but... He went above the fray, obviously. He, he, did, he wasn't baited into certain um, of the more uh, horrendous claims against him. And one of the books I used uh, actually was, was very apt in its description because after this event, uh, the Klan activity in Hastings County kind of dies down. So uh, the author here, that uh, Edward Buckley, he said, Dawson's letter of appreciation seemed to close the issue for the Klan in Hastings County. But we have to ask, why, why did the Klan actually fail? I mean, uh, we all know that certain views were uh, socially acceptable at the time, uh, but why they failed, uh, historians have answered that, and it's because of the Orange Order, uh, not because uh, uh, people were, were above such petty uh, prejudices. So one historian has argued that the robust imperial British and orange culture of the 1920s was a barrier 
uh, that the Klan couldn't overcome. Uh, here's a quote for you to ponder, and it's from the, uh, not a Klansman, although it sounds very much like a Klan, Klan quote, the government I represent upholds British traditions, British institutions, one flag, one language for the dominion. Uh, unless something is done to meet this French-speaking invasion, this national outrage, the dominion will be stricken to its foundations as this war had not stricken it before. No, it, that was actually the premier uh, uh, speaking uh, to a clan, or not a clan, to an orange uh, audience. Uh, so Klansmen shared uh, kind of the virulent hatred of uh, Roman Catholics uh, who, another great quote, they revered the Pope above the crown, the yellow flag of Rome above the Union Jack. And one uh, thing that they kept on claiming was that uh, the fact that uh, English Canada was so successful, was that because it wasn't French? And why? Education. Did you know, for example, that 47% of Quebec uh, children in the 1920s couldn't read? Yeah, that's actually not true. But, it, but that's one of their arguments. Uh, and another ludicrous claim was that they had planned to transfer 120,000 uh, Quebecers uh, to parts of northern Ontario and Saskatchewan, where, with their wives and sweethearts, a vote of 20, of 2,000, sorry, no, 200,500 could be controlled. Those papists. So, uh, if you're not, uh, well, the Klan was active here, but it, but it was much stronger where uh, I go to school down south, uh, near Waterloo. And uh, because there was a sizable black population there, uh, the Klan was able to thrive much more in kind of the American context. So towns could boast of their, quote, pet blacks who would regale youngsters with tales of slavery down in the old plantation sing Negro spirituals, and play the fiddle. Uh, yeah. The Klan uh, thrived only because in the immediate post-war period, uh, there was an anxiety about immigration, about uh, the arrival of new cultures. So surely we haven't, you know, that, that's nothing we, we, we know about today. So they saw themselves as winners of the war, but also losers of the war. Uh, Canada's participation was meant to defend uh, the British Empire. And the arrival of immigrants meant that the empire was actually collapsing because there weren't enough British men to have British babies and for those British babies to come over here and make more British Canadian babies and so on. Uh, it took uh, a few years before there was actually a national uh, clan organization, so mostly it was local chapters. Uh, but when they did organize uh, a na nationwide group in 1926, you'll never guess who turned out to be the leader, the Reverend George Marshall. Uh, he made no secret uh, uh, of this uh, in public, and if you can... He wasn't even born here, that's the thing. Marshall, for all his uh, patriotic uh, fervor, was born in England, and he only arrived when he was, I think, 50-something. Uh, and, yeah. His church, uh, interestingly enough, still exists. Uh, they, are no, they do not condone uh, Klan activity or racism, I should say, in case any of their people end up listening. Uh, but there is, before I finish, there is one more person I want to talk about, and it's a guy I've already mentioned, talked about. His name was Rutten. Can I? Yeah, that's a threatening letter uh, that was sent by the Klan to a Catholic. You are not obeying the law, right? 
write your ways and pay full measure to all. If not, look for the trouble. It's already near. Yeah. That's uh, a very, th that article was actually written in the 60s. And even for the 60s, it was very forgiving of the Klan. Uh, and it's from, oddly enough, uh, a mainstream Protestant kind of journal. Uh, uh, there were some Belleville members. So uh, Rutten was the manager of the Belleville Sash and Door Company. Other, clues, other members included uh, A.B. Sandborg, uh, Alan Robertson, C.H. Marvin, Fred and Elizabeth Smith, who were actually kicked out of the Klan. I don't know why, but uh, it was a big thing. I, I read the documents. Uh, so part of their initial success, I would say, is only because uh, Reverend Marshall was able to uh, give it a degree of local uh, prominence uh, that it otherwise wouldn't have. And so I hate coming up with conclusions. Uh, I really do. They're, they're awful to, uh, so uh, I just wanted to rehash something. So Dawson's courageous act of resistance uh, uh, was recounted by, as I said, Edward Buckley. And uh, he ended it by saying that uh, Dawson uh, was David in his slingshot war against the clan Goliath. And I think that's very apt. So thank you very much. Trevor. Yeah. When, when, I, um, when I was told the story about my great uncle and aunt uh, and uh, having the cross burned on their lawn, I never thought too much about the story. And other than that, that I knew that the Ku Klux Klan was involved. But um, tonight, you've put a, put a face to this issue for me, and uh, I really can't say too much about it. It's a pretty powerful story. It's, you've given us an informative, educational, interesting evening, and I thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Thank you.